Good evening, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi from Photo Shelter headquarters in New York City. We have uh, a global panel today. Uh, Martin Bailey, a nature and wildlife photographer, is actually located in Tokyo, Japan, and I, I guess it's about 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. for him. So uh, <laughs> huge thanks to Martin for, for uh, joining us today. Martin, welcome. Thank you very much, Alan. It's, it's 8 a.m. here. 8 so it's, it's, yeah, but it's a beautiful Tokyo morning. <laughs> Getting ready for the day. Um, we should also thank x Right, who is a co-sponsor here, and, and Brenda Hipsher from x Right is, is joining us and is free to answer a lot of questions about the, the wonderful color management and calibration uh, tools that they have from a, a variety of, of, of price points, and many of which I personally own. And, and I, I wasn't paid to say that. I actually owned them before, they, uh, before we ever did anything with them. So Brenda, welcome. Thank you so much. And Alan, just let me thank you there at Photo Shelter. And Martin, a sincere thanks to you for doing this webinar. This is a very exciting uh, collaboration we have tonight. And uh, thank you so much for doing it. Um, so everyone knows on the line, we are recording this webinar and we will have it up within the next 24 hours. In addition, uh, Brenda is uh, manning the question uh, panel there. So on the right of your screen, you should see a question panel for the GoToWebinar software that we're using. So feel free to a ask uh, Brenda any questions as we're moving along, and she'll do her best to answer them. Um, but let's get started. Hey, Martin, what the heck are you doing in uh, Tokyo over there? <laughs> well, I, I actually, I moved here uh, 21 years ago now, and um, originally came with a totally different trade, and I switched. I went, I went to college here after a few years, and then I ended up um, just getting sucked in as soon as I was always into photography and as soon as digital came along it just sort of you know the computer side and the, the photography all merging together was just an amazing a revolution for me really so I got sucked in and I started a podcast in 95 which became pretty popular and everything's just snowballed from there really it, it turned into my my full-time job um, just two years ago now so I, uh, it really, the, the social media aspect and the sharing all helped me to become a, a full-time photographer, which is probably one of the dreams of many people. So I, uh, I hope to share some information about that today as well. But yeah, Tokyo, I, I work around Japan uh, mainly with, I mean, we, we've got the snow monkeys here. We've got some beautiful parks where they have lots of, I mean, we see on the screen now, we've got lots of beautiful color in the parks around here and then there's lots of natural landscape um, but um, the, the the northern island of Japan Hokkaido is my, probably my favorite favorite place on earth the second favorite place is probably Antarctica but um, <laughs> it's uh, I, I, I guess I like cold places uh, you know the first image we had up there was snow monkeys the uh, I think the next image we have in line here is is some red crown cranes that are just amazing. I think the ballet was based on these guys, yeah. um, and you know, they. I I take tours up here every year. So uh, actually, next year we've got two tours, and the second one's just sold out. So it's uh, that's that's going well. Um, but yeah, these the I I generally shoot nature and wildlife. Um, lots of cold places on my itinerary through the year. I'm going to be in Antarctica three times towards the end of this year with. Aurora expeditions out of Sydney and uh, just basically having a great time. Um, this this image that we have on the screen right now is it's a, a blue iceberg that's basically just floating past the ship. It was rough seas near Deception Island um, on the way out of the Antarctic uh, last April that would have been. But yeah, it's uh, it, lots of fun. Tokyo, I, I actually made myself a, a, a Japanese citizen um, couple of years ago as well so that's uh, that's really taken a lot of pressure off me I don't need to get a visa I actually need a visa I need a visa now to go back to England so it's uh, it's all sort of flipped over on its head now you like many people really got interested with with, with the digital photography in part because it's so much easier to, to create images at, at what point of shooting digital did did this color management thing all of a sudden become very important to your workflow I, I think really it was the most important part, and this is why I tie it all together, was when I started to really print my work. Um, I think the from around 2005-ish, a little bit more, I mean obviously 
uh, Epson and Canon have been making great printers for many years, but um, it really started when I when I started to print, and I was just getting the the things that were coming out of my printer weren't looking a lot like what I saw on my screen. Um, and over the years, with advice from people, some that I shrugged initially because I just didn't want to do it, but you know, people had given me some advice here and there, and just read up on a few things, and it all just sort of started to tie in, and now. I I feel as though I've got I've just got a very um, I don't know sleek workflow where everything just works and it's mostly down to Xrite and their amazing tools. So I uh, I've really enjoyed. You know, Xrite contacted me a few years ago about joining their Colorati, uh, which is you know a, a band of merry men around the world that all um, really get you know get color management and help to spread the word about that. And so it's been great. It's you know lots of uh, lots of people have have been picking up on my my book that we'll probably touch on later as well. But it, you know, just making printing a a lot easier, uh, and just the, the entire digital workflow a lot easier by implementing a few relatively simple most of the time uh, processes and and procedures. So if I'm if I'm kind of a photo enthusiast or I'm a I'm a I'm a pro, and you know I've spent a couple thousand dollars on my photo equipment. Yeah. Why should I care about color management? Yeah, well, it's really the the biggest thing. I mean, there's there's really this this big myth that you know color management is gonna is gonna fix everything, and everyone in the whole world will see things together. And that's not really the case. Um, it, it's important because you you need to lock down and know exactly what where you are, you know, how your images will look when you export them. Um, and it's if if you control it from the very first pixel right through until you print, then every part of the the process becomes just a lot easier. Um, the the output is a higher quality, and it's it's just basically lock not locks. I was going to say locks you in, but it doesn't lock you in, in in a negative sense. It just locks everything down to remove the guesswork, and so you know it's. I mean, we have on the slide here. We can got to get the the digital workflow from exposure right from the very start. And this is where we'll touch on these things as we move through this. But not just sort of shoot willy nilly and then come back and yeah. and try and fix everything in post because that that never really works. Um, it's getting easier to do that, but it's you get the best quality images if you nail the exposure in camera and then. You we you basically use uh, the Xrite Color Checker Passport to create camera profiles, and they help us to to know that the what's coming out of the camera is is spot on color wise, um, and it it also gives us the tools to to change things in an, a way that we know. For for example, you can use an image of the Color Checker Passport to not only get a spot on white balance for that particular light source, you can also use it to warm up or cool down the image. So you might want to warm up portraits, but if you if you're in the middle of a you know a, a field of snow like I often am, you might want to give that a slight bluer tinge to make it feel colder. And you can do all of that with the color checker passport. But then, as long as you have your monitor calibrated after that, then really you're you're on the road to to seeing everything. How the camera would have seen it if if it was in a perfect world, right? And also, you know, cameras don't. I mean, you can have two of the same body of camera; they're likely to be close, but then they're not going to be exactly the same. And if you shoot with two or three different camera bodies, then bringing those all into line is just becomes very very easy if you take a moment to get a shot of the color checker passport while you're in the field. Uh, you can essentially get. A 5D and a, say a, a 7D or a, an XTI or something like that. They're very different bodies. Um, you can get them all producing the same sort of color, and that that's quite quite important, especially if you're using cameras that are a few years apart as well. I guess uh, part of it, you know, when you talk about white balance and and, and making uh, the colors accurate, is is the intentional. The intentional color management on on behalf of the photographer, so that that right. the whites are kind of white because you wanted them white, or they're slightly blue because you wanted them slightly blue, or slightly warm because you right. wanted them slightly warm. Right. 
it, it's, I mean, I'm kind of a bit of a control freak, um, <laughs> but <laughs> you, you may be able to tell. Um, but I think that control really liberates you in that it gives, it, it, like I say, it takes away the guesswork. If you know that you've got the tools to, to make something look one way or another, or to make it look exactly how it should have been, you know, with, without all of the other variables taken away, then it really just frees you to make the decision and move along quickly in your workflow. I'm, I'm not one for spending a lot of time in Photoshop, uh, just in my images. And I, I just really want everything to be as, as smooth as possible, but as high quality as possible. Quality is a big thing for me. I, I don't want to put images out there that don't look or represent my best work. And so it, you know, nailing it all and, and freeing yourself from the decisions is, is a big a big plus in my book. So we spend a lot of time, obviously, talking to photographers about how they can increase sales through marketing. So I love your last bullet point saying, even if you have the best looking print in the world, selling yeah. it is still a, a marketing challenge, right? It is. Um, I think that there's, uh, and I, I chose one way, and, uh, and there's probably, if you've got 100 photographers, there's probably 100 different ways to do it. But I, th I think that now, you know, finding ways to get the, the word out without saturating people with, I mean, you don't want to be self-promoting all the time. But I think that what I've found is, is that sharing what I know about photography has been huge for me. And it's, it's pretty selfless most of the time. And then every so often I'll drop a message in there that I, you know, of something that I'm doing. And hopefully it's, you know, if you get the, the ratio right, then it, it's something that you can do and, and help to I don't know, keep a roof over your head if this is all you do. Uh, and if, even if it's not all you do, selling prints is, I had a, a, an email from a friend in, I think in the UK yesterday about this very thing. Um, he's thinking of, of going pro and, or, or you know, making this his full-time job. And my suggestion was to initially create a, a gallery. Uh, I actually, uh, because I mean, I use Photo Shelter myself, so I, I suggested to him that he that he creates a Photo Shelter account and creates a web gallery with and and enable the sales. Uh, because if the, obviously if you're going to be a professional photographer that requires money <laughs> to to stay alive, most of us do. Then you know you need to be able to at least feel the water first and see if people are prepared to buy your images. Yeah. And so set up a, a, a website. It, you can do it either by a photo shelter or, or there's a, so, and we, we can touch on this as well, but there's a lot of um, plugins for WordPress, for example. Yeah. WooCommerce gives you the ability to add a, um, a, a shopping cart to a WordPress site. And you can just you know, basically set it up there that, and you, you have people that will be able to buy your prints. Um, obviously, with Photo Shelter, you can actually sell stock images or, or sell the license to, for, for images. And that really gives you a, a point as where you know, you know that if people are, are actually going to be prepared to buy your work or not, if, you know, you, you've got to be able to sell stuff. And that really requires high quality work and a lot of time on the marketing side as well. Um, I love... Uh your second point here on, on why calibration is important, which is people's monitors are generally too bright. It seems like with these screens nowadays that we confuse uh, kind of fidelity of the image with the brightness of the image. Mm. Yeah, they, uh, they're really, um, I mean, they, this is 90% this is of the secret. You know, once I've told you this, everyone can log out. <laughs> just joking, guys. Okay, stay, stay there, please. Um, but really, it's, it's just been um, a, a revelation for me. A, a guy, and I, I've tried to find this email so that I can, I can thank him, but a number of years ago, I was talking about how I added a certain amount of brightness or exposure when I printed to compensate for the fact that the prints were always too dark. And one guy emailed me and said, no, it's not the prints that are too dark. It's your monitors that are too bright. You've got to dim them down. And I said, oh, no, I don't want to do that. No way. And, and this is what probably 90% of the people that are listening now are thinking too. But honestly, the, your monitor's too bright. <laughs> Everybody in the room almost. Unless you use, already use x tools to check the level of the ambient light 
and adjust your monitors or your displays brightness accordingly the chances are that it's too bright um, and, and to give you a, an idea I, I use a MacBook Pro and an Azol um, display as my external monitor and generally my MacBook Pro you know you have the little, little brightness slider it's it's generally around one third from the bottom so mm -hmm. I've, I've got it down at like 33% of its full brightness and my Azor monitor as well I have that set sometimes as low as 18% out of 100 and it's it's the, the max I'll go to is in the 30s so around uh, you know a third or so of the full brightness of the monitor is where I where I need to be now this is based on my ambient lighting uh, obviously if you work in a very bright environment then you're going to need it brighter to compensate but the you know the, the important thing is that you if you're printing and you're seeing everything looking a lot darker than what's on your screen don't compensate by I mean like Lightroom 4 now has a brightness slider right there in the print module and it's the only thing I don't like about Lightroom 4 um, and, I mean obviously I just don't use it so I don't need to complain about that but it's I think that that's the lazy way to do it and if you were to, to take control of your your workflow darken that monitor down then you'll you'll put yourself in a better position to remove a lot of the frustration with your printing and um, it does mean though and this is this is a big thing that a lot of people when they darken their monitor down they find that their images look too dark as well and I'm sorry to tell you that's probably because you've been underexposing your images as well. Mm. Uh, and this is, I mean, obviously, if you like the way they look, that's great. It's your photography. You do it, do it how you want to do. But if you're finding that you're getting dark prints, then what you need to do is, like I say, darken the monitor down. But then also, you're probably going to need to tweak a lot of the images that you shot a little on the dark side as well. Um, you know, we, we touch on this later, but you, you basically want to shoot to the right, which means that you have the information in the histogram uh, it, the brightest part of your image should be uh, here we go you're exposed to the right um, so the right side of the histogram uh, if we look at the the histogram on the screen there's a, a, a Lightroom capture there a screen capture on there as well now I mean this is a studio shot so easy to easy to basically set up the lights and things but this I do this all the time. The right side of the histogram should be just about touching the right side of the histogram frame, the box. Um, and I, I see this. I've, I've got a. I wrote exposure to the right there. It's exposed to the right or shoot to the right. Um, but that really, if you've got a lot of dark images, then you need to just grab that exposure slider and pull it up a little bit until the histogram is almost touching the right side. Uh, and that's that's for images that are. I mean, if it's a very dark image, then you you might not want to do that. Um, obviously, because it'll it'll ruin the mood of the image. But when you're shooting, if you shoot to the right, even for a very dark image, if you can get the shutter speeds, then still do that. But then adjust for the for the mood of the image later, because the the more of the data that you can capture in the right side of the histogram, the better quality of the pixels. Uh, it just the, it's just the way images are written they have half of the data in the first 10 percent or so of the the right side of the image and then half of the remaining so it's like a thousand on the right and then the second stop is 500 the one after that is 250 and it halves with every stop so towards the left side you get very little data actually used to write the image so shooting to the right or exposing to the right is important even if your your end result is going to be a much darker image. We talk about the X-Rite color checker, which is this little color palette, if you will, a lot. Yeah. Um, why why do I need this versus just uh, you know a gray card to sort of balance my my white balance? Well, a gray card only gives you what you've got at the top here. I mean, this this color checker passport. If you flip it over the other the other side, you actually get a gray card in there. And you can you can use that to set a custom white balance in the field if you want to. Um, that's important if you want to see exactly the the way I use the RGB histogram on my camera, and it's important to set a custom white balance if you need to see the colors on your um, on your, the back of your camera. But the what you have here on this side is the the top. There are six five. Um, 
two rows of five gray pal uh, gray patches in the top there, and the middle one, the very left, top left, and the middle one at the bottom are neutral grays, and the others they're what they're what you have to warm up or cool down the white balance of the image in post processing. You just basically use the the white balance picker in Lightroom or in Adobe Camera Raw, uh, and that will enable you to lock in your your white balance where it should be. But the beauty of the color checker passport is that there's a plugin for Lightroom and there's also a standalone program from X-Rite that allows you to create a camera profile and if you go on, on this the screenshot here if you go to the camera calibration panel in Lightroom then you can actually you have a profile there's a little profile pull down once you've exported the image of the color checker passport to the x uh plugin that creates them. You, you have to restart Lightroom because of the architecture of the program, but once you've done that, you'll actually get a, a profile in there, and it's like a printer profile or a display profile, where what it does is it, the, the software, or, or once you've got this ICC profile, it's saying, okay, so this is what the camera thinks a red and a blue and a green is, but and, and all of the other colors on that that target there. It's, it's, so the, the cameras, the, the software is basically saying, so the camera thinks that this is what a true red looks like. But we know from this image that a true red actually looks like this. And so it's doing a little translation. And generally, when you, even with the 5D Mark III and the 1DX, the, the two new, newest bodies from Canon, this is still the case. The camera thinks a red is a little bit more muted than the, and this is even in raw files. The camera thinks that a red is a little bit more muted than it really is. And so when you apply the camera profile, the uh, the reds, the greens, and the blues, and a number of other patches here just pop in. And what you're doing there is you're registering the images with what you know to be uh, a slightly different color to what the camera sees. And so, you know, the, to answer your question just briefly again, that white balance is really just the start. And once you once you have these these registrations or, or these reference points with a, a new set of colors, you can remap what the camera sees to what the computer sees and what eventually people will see and you'll print, etc. So are you taking a reference shot of the color checker passport every time you start a shoot effectively? Most of the time. Um, and it actually gets a little bit easier as the camera gets older. Um, what I do is, even in just pure daylight in the middle of the day no no challenging light at all i will just take the take the color checker passport out when i'm on location and just shoot a frame of it um it the color checker passport doesn't have to fill the frame uh, and that's good because with long lenses for wildlife you end up often having to because the, the minimum focal st focal distance is quite uh, is quite far away but it doesn't have to fill the frame it doesn't even have to be sharp um, the important thing is that it has to be well exposed. So again, nailing the exposure in camera, uh, and and I do the same thing here, exposed to the right. I'll generally set my exposure so that I'm like a third of a stop down from blowing out the whitest patch on the card. But yeah, once you've once you've got that image, you, you can't. They're not interchangeable between cameras. Uh, so if you if you're out shooting with two cameras. You do need to shoot the color checker passport twice, once with each camera. But then when you get home, you use that. If you didn't do a custom white balance, you use that to set the white balance, create the profile, and then you just use the sync features in Lightroom to sync that to all of the other uh, images that you shot at that location. And when you do that, you'll basically lock in. So yeah, this here we have a good example. This is a, a white-tailed eagle that I shot on one of my workshops in Hokkaido and you'll see that the blue sky is pretty much, that's how the camera captured it, not pretty much, that's exactly how the camera captured it and the default um, settings in Lightroom when I imported the image. Uh, obviously these are exported as JPEG but they're, they're, it's all done so that they're pretty much exactly what you see on the screen. And the larger image is one with the color checker passport uh, profile or a profile created with the color checker passport applied and you'll see that the blue sky is is so much more vivid 
and you, you, if you look at this closely, you can actually see that the the eagle's beak is actually yellower in the in the new version, and so it really just and and this just looks so much more punchy, and it's you know the the original is a little bit flat, it's not not, not much contrast, and it's it's just basically a not a not a great shot. But the the updated version with the color checker passport profile applied is much more punchy, and uh, I just I use it even in in situations where the you know the lighting is not particularly challenging, uh, but I did mention that it gets easier, and that's because once I know that I've got a good uh, profile for say you know mid mid winter clear day, I'll have another one that's and I usually in in the name of the profiles that I create, I'll I actually write the color temperature as well. Although Xrite do provide a, a a DNG manager software, so you can go in and check this. But when I'm selecting images, I like to be able to see what the original color, uh, the white balance was, and so I'll include that in the name. But if you if you've got similar um, situations, especially with outdoor, or if you've got a a studio setup that you know is going to produce constant lighting, you don't need to do this every time. But one, yeah, but you you do have to recreate it for each camera that you have. So you you'll basically start to build up a library of profiles for your cameras as they get older. And then, just as you've got a really nice library, Canon will release a new model, and you feel you have to update, and <laughs> you lose them all. But uh, it's it's basically uh, it, it gets easier the, the more you the more you use them. Uh, but it, it's very easy anyway. It's just a, literally a few minute job in the field, and a couple of minutes when you start processing your images. So we have three different uh, price points for X-ray calibration tools. Um, two of which I own, yeah. although not the, the new one. What if if I'm just starting out again with uh, with with color management? What what should I be looking for? What should I what should I get? Well, uh, I mean, these the three that we have here is really just a subset. This is what I've got. Um, and I use in my workshops um, with the aid of of X um, These these things are are the we on the left we have the Color Monkey Photo, in the middle we have the new i1 Pro, and on the right we have the i1 Display Pro. And these they really have uh, have different functions, and they all provide you know industry standard or world class calibration of displays. The Color Monkey and the i1 Pro will also allow you to do printer um, profiling or pr create profiles for printers. But obviously, the price points are very different. The the cheapest one here is actually on the right. the The display is retailing at around two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, Xrite also do a Color Monkey, uh, a smaller Color Monkey that doesn't do printer profiling. I think that's about one hundred and sixty dollars or so. Um, I on the the left side, this was the first calibration tool that I started using from X Right, uh, and the, you know, the Color Monkey is great. It's very versatile. Uh, this is a, this retails at around four hundred and fifty dollars at the moment, and I believe that X Right have kindly provided us with some um, some code, or not codes, but this, you know some rebate information later. But we we have four hundred and fifty dollars for the Color Monkey, but this guy. Well, for four hundred and fifty dollars, you can not only do your, uh, you know, calibrate your monitor, you can cal calibrate printers. You can use this to create printer profiles as well and projectors, as we have here. Um, uh, but I I jumped to the original, not this the new guy here, but I initially jumped to the first i1 Pro device uh, spectrophotometer when I bought a large format printer, and you know the the Color Monkey is great. It does a really good job, um, but I, I like to think of this as more of as like a prosumer. Uh, if you're printing on A3 Plus, 13 by 19 printer, or around there, then they're, they're perfect. If you go above that, you need to make a decision as to you know the, the Color Monkey will still support that, of course, but you you need to make a decision as to how important this is to you. And if you want the best you know, industry standard color. Then you, the i1 Pro is the way to go, and there's there's actually I've, I've got this down here as you know as being something that can calibrate printers, but there's actually a there's a number of different flavors that, or solutions built around the i1 Pro or i1 Pro 2 photo uh, spectrophotometer, and that's basically we have the the basic uh, Pro 2. 
and that will allow the quality assurance part of the printing side but it doesn't actually allow you to uh, produce printer profiles but the the perfect point uh, for photographers with the i1 pro 2 is the photo package uh, and that basically it's called i1 photo pro 2 and I mean that this though it re retails at the moment at around a thousand five hundred and there are a bunch of uh, upgrade offers and things available as well so this is a, this is one of those things that you know you could go off and buy another a new lens um, but if you really think that this is important to you and especially if you're printing to large format printers uh, or you're you're doing work that is very color you know color critical then this is the way to go it's the industry standard and the new upgrade I'm, I'm actually going to be releasing a, a review of the i1 Pro 2 spectral photometer today uh, within probably six hours or so of this of this webinar um, this guy will basically it's like it's the new it's the new industry standard you're not going to get any better than this so if if it's important to you then you know save the pennies and get and go for the big guy here so um, let, let's step back for for a moment and and talk sure. about you know starting with the camera because we're getting a lot of questions uh, I assume you're shooting raw because it gives you the ability to shift the white balance um, yes and when when well, you step yeah. out kind of into the field are you using like an auto white balance with the intention of fixing it later because you took a reference shot with the color checker pro passport pro no I and this again it's personal preference but I never use white balance um, I uh, I auto white balance sorry auto white balance basically what what that will give you is a different white balance for every image you shoot and you when you're looking at the back of the camera you want to be seeing something constant um, and so I always shoot in the daylight preset uh, if the daylight preset is not going to work for me I'll do a custom white balance uh, again, I mean, maybe a little bit of a control freak thing here going on here, but I, I just don't, you know, I don't trust auto white balance. It's good, it's getting better, but still, when it, what it's doing is it's looking at the colors in the screen or the light bouncing off of the colors in the screen, and in the scene, sorry. And what that does is literally you can you can see color shifts from frame to frame. And when I'm looking at the RGB histogram and trying to expose to the right and make sure that everything is is exposed for the best quality image possible, that I don't want to see things shifting around. So it's always auto white balance for me in the field. Uh, but on RAW, you the camera actually you know people think that the the camera is creating basically a JPEG version of the same image, and of course it is. But if you've got a lot of very detailed texture like a, a field of grass then the camera can actually mush that together and you end up with a lower quality image uh, if you shoot JPEG and so you know and this is one of those like Mac Windows sort of things where people get very you know heated up about the discussion but basically if you care about the quality of your images shoot raw you know hard disk space is, is relatively cheap these days sure copying it around and backups can be gets a lot more difficult but uh, if if you really if you care about and I'm thinking that if people are already on this call uh, or this webinar then they care about the photography then if you're not already shooting raw then do yourself a favor and switch it over because you it will give you the best quality images that are that you can possibly shoot um, it's not just about giving you the ability to change the settings later it, the quality of the image is better and and you're shooting uh, I assume in Adobe RGB as the color space I do, um, but and this this is one of those things where a lot of people say, yeah, but it doesn't matter because it's it's all ignored with the raw file. Um, the reason that I do that is because the Adobe RGB color space can show or you know or capture more color. Now again, the raw profile, the raw image is capturing everything, and and it's not changed in any way by whether, by whether you have sRGB or Adobe RGB selected in the camera. But again, on the back of the camera, I, I believe that the, the images, the, the colors that you see in the RGB histogram are affected by the, if you chip, flip, flip it over into Adobe RGB, you can actually get um, a little bit more information in the preview. And so to me, you know, again, tweaking in the camera while you're shooting, getting it right in camera is very important to me. 
and to the quality of the resulting images. So I always use Adobe RGB there in the camera as well. And and in terms of you know shooting to the right and finding the you know quote correct exposure, which obviously is subjective to the extent that you know what's your subject and what are you trying to pull from the image, but is it fair to say that you are using the histogram to determine whether the exposure is accurate? Yeah, I, I actually I I I like to use the term ideal exposure. Uh, you know, like because um, correct does imply that it's that there's there's a right and a wrong, uh, but like you say, it's very subjective, and so I like to use the the term ideal exposure, um, and that. Is really you know an ideal is 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 subjective. Everyone has a different ideal, so that's why I choose that that particular phrase. But I yeah I I use the histogram to to know that I'm exposing exposing the image and getting it as as bright and vivid as possible, um, without blowing out any of the individual channels. So you know people, uh, if you if you only use the the brightness histogram. Then that's showing you an average of, the, you know, the the light in the image. But the RGB histogram, say if you're shooting a field full of red flowers, um, the RGB histogram obviously will show you that your red is blowing out while your greens and your blues are fine. So if you average that out, you could still get home and find out that you've got lots of patches of blotchy red in the scene, um, and that's because you've blown out the red channel and you didn't know because the histogram didn't tell you. Right. Um, so that that's why I use the RGB. But yeah, I, that that's my that's my guide. I, you know, to me, um, chimping is is important. Not to the not to the extent that you miss shots, but uh, making sure that you're getting your images right is it just really helps if you've got the histogram and also the blinkies turned on. Uh, make sure that you've got it, the overexposure warning turned on so that if things do start to go out, it's fine if it's intentional. You know, I'll sometimes blow out a sky for the sake of a uh, or snow for the sake of a, a well-exposed subject. Yeah. If it's intentional, that's fine. But just keep your eye on the blinkies and make sure that things are in where you think they're going to be. So be. the the monitor calibration portion of it, and, and we have here the the i1 Pro kind of hanging on the monitor there. You know, I've read mm. things that say you you should be, the monitors drift and you should be calibrating every three days. In, in all <laughs> honesty, how often are you actually calibrating your monitors? I I do mine just on a on a regular. You know the the sort of schedule that I like to do is once a month, um, but I, I will say that if you if you're about to do a job, say if I was going to sit down to print for an exhibition, I would calibrate the, the monitor first. I would calibrate the printer first as well. Um, but I yeah generally if you are um, if you're about to do something critical, then take a moment to calibrate before that. But otherwise, just for general working, once a month is fine. And if you're busy, then you know even less is is fine. As long as you make sure that you've you've got it a mental note to to do another a recalibrate before you do some critical work. Um, we started at the top by 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 talking about you know that you have this laptop, but it's also hooked into uh, you know an expensive ASO monitor, which is just known for having great color fidelity, etc. Yeah. How, you know, are you the type of person that that puts the hood on and has the Munsell gray <laughs> wall and you know really controls the ambient light, or you know what what what's the what's the line you're towing there? Well, I think this is uh, well. In, in answer to your question, no, I'm not. Um, I did go for an ASO monitor, but I didn't go for the top of the the line with all of the fancy features or the hood and stuff like that. Um, it's also getting very long in the tooth now. I've had this monitor for maybe, I don't know, maybe six six years or so now. Um, but I, I think it's with everything. It's like even with the the calibration tools that you go for, it you get what you pay for. And if you can afford something a little bit better, but you can't afford to go the whole hog, like me going for the Azo over a, a different brand, but not the best Azo. Then this is this is something that that I like to do. You know, be happy with your purchases. I, I think that there's a lot of uh, pressure in in photography at the moment with all of these nice lenses and new bodies and things. Uh, if you're happy with what you've got, then be happy with it and just use it and make great images. Um, and the same goes for the for the monitors. If you can afford a little bit better, then you'll you'll get the benefits. I mean, I can literally see if I the the MacBook Pros display is it's not too shabby you know it, it, it's a relatively nice monitor uh, display for a, 
essentially a laptop. Um, but when I have the same image on the Azor monitor, I can see more, more fidelity in the image. I can see more detail in the shadows. I can see, I can have like snow, for example, on the MacBook Pro dis display where it looks as though it's just totally white with no texture. And when I look at the same snow on the Azor display, I can see texture in it. And so there is difference. It's not just about the color. It's about the, you know, the amount of detail that you actually can see in mm -hmm. the images as well. So much of photo consumption now does happen on computers. And yeah. obviously, most of our audiences as photographers, most of the people that are checking out our images, you know, have crappy monitors with the brightness up 100% and haven't <laughs> calibrated them. Is it really worth it in the end to go through all this trouble when we know that, you know, my mom's looking at it on, you know, a five-year-old PC monitor? <laughs> well, the good news is, is that they are getting better. I mean, even the, the I was going to say even, the, the, the iPad, um, the initial, the first iPad had a great screen and it's getting better all the time. And, you know, people will, will be using like $300 netbooks and things. And you can't control how other people see your images. Uh, so that, I mean, is actually the myth that I, I had slated to talk about in the first, uh, in the, the start of the presentation. You can't, calibrating is for yourself initially. You know, the, the biggest reason that I calibrate is not so that everyone else can see my images how I do, because that'll never happen. It's so that I can free myself from the, the hassles of worrying about it. Uh, and it's also so that I can print without seeing a, a big difference in how the image looks when it comes out of the printer. So really, the, you calibrate for yourself above all. Um, the second thing, uh, especially if you're a working photographer, is that your clients benefit. Most people that work in imaging, in graphic design or, or in publication, will have monitors that are calibrated. And X-Rite is, is basically the industry standard. And they, if you, you can be pretty much uh, confident that the people that you're handing images over to in a professional environment are also calibrating with X-Rite's tools or some tool that, that will make sure that you're seeing something very similar. So it's, it's really firstly for you and for your clients. And the rest of the world, it's, it's just like, I don't know, hope, hope and pray that they, that they, I mean, people tell me that my images, that they, people say that I shoot very high key images. And I like that because it, it tells me that I'm doing what I want to do right. But it also tells me that I'm, I'm still right in that everyone's using, most people are using the monitors very bright. Um, cause to me, my images aren't that high key. They're just, they're just well exposed, uh, and they print well. We have a lot of people asking, um, for monitor recommendations, actually. Um, you, you're using Azo and that's spelled E I Z O, but do you think that yes. the, you know, the standard, you know, Mac monitor nowadays is pretty, is good enough? Oh, I think, I mean, if, when this Azo eventually dies on me, I would love one of the big. Um, 27 inch Mac screens. I'm probably going to go for an iMac or something like that. Yeah. Um, but the the tendency at the moment, unfortunately, is to is to be moving away from the the non reflective screens. I, I bought a MacBook Pro with a non reflective screen. Um, I believe that there is an iMac slated an iMac update slated for with a a matte screen. Um, I I think images look great on the glossy screens. Um, and obviously, if, if people are using this as a family computer, then their kids are probably going to enjoy the games more with a glossy screen. But ideally, uh, if you're serious about the, your photography and it's, a, and it's a photography dedicated machine, then try to get a non-reflective um, screen. Um, or, and the, the other thing, I mean, actual makers, I, I'm not really up on what's available, um, but I, I believe NEC do good um, screens as well, and HP have a relatively low, uh, inexpensive but very high quality range of um, screens out as well. There, it's I've not I'm not really in the market at the moment, um, so it's not something that I can give a quick sort of snappy answer to. Yeah. I'm afraid. Uh, 
preparing your environment for printing. So this obviously the, the output for prints and fine art prints is a key consideration for color management. Why don't you take us through uh, your process? Sure. I the the big thing here, and this is something that we touched on earlier, is is making the, for the environment you have to make sure that your monitor is is darkened down. Um, you if you even if you don't have a calibration tool to to check the ambient le light levels in your room, you can see whether what's coming out of your printer is darker than what's on your screen. So at the very least, print something that you know is, you know, check the histogram, make sure that the histo you, you, you've got the image well exposed to begin with. But if you print something that was exposed how you think it should have, should have looked uh, by the histogram, not what you see on the screen, then print it out and then reduce the brightness of your monitor to roughly match. I mean, a backlit image is always going to look a little bit punchier, and your shadows might be plugged up more in the print. But if you print, print it out and it's, it's way too dark, then just try initially to darken the screen down to match the print. Um, but the ideal way would be to, to take an ambient reading with a calibration tool and use that as a guide. Um, but then, you know, really the, the whole um, process, the whole workflow just gets much easier if you, if you use something to not only set the, the screen to the right brightness, but use, use that tool to, you know, really bring the, the colors that the screen is displaying to you in, and the highlights and shadows, all of that is affected by a, a calibration. And then the, the next thing really is to take, take that tool. If, if printing is important to you, then you know, avoid the, for, for now, the i1 display uh, because that doesn't do printer profiles. Uh, ideally, what you'll do is take control of the process to the very end. And to do that, you need to use the Color Monkey Photo or the i1 Pro 2. Um, which is you know the, the newest model now available. If you use these tools, then you can actually pr produce a printer profile or an ICC profile. And then, if you've started with a Color Monkey photo, uh, Color Monkey check, uh, sorry, a Color Checker passport, and you have your camera calibrated, you have your display calibrated, and you've created an ICC profile for your printer. Uh, and obviously, this is different. If you have use different papers, you have to calibrate for each paper. Um, but if you've got all three of those things under control, then it just gets so much easier. You can, you know that with, and they're, they're very easy steps to take. You just make sure that you, you grab the photo of the color checker passport in the field uh, or in the studio or wherever. Get, get your images locked in. Then know that you're editing them and looking at them on a, on a display that's been calibrated. And it's like, like we're saying, it's, it's once a month. It's not a big deal. And then if you've created the ICC profiles for your printer, it becomes very easy to just, you know, you, you just do, I mean, it's very corny, but I, I sometimes say it, it makes your workflow, you know, literally, it, it, the workflow should do that. Um, so really just take control over everything. And at the very least, if you, I mean, I know that money is a factor for everybody. Um, but at the very least, try to take control of the printing by downloading the ICC profiles for that particular paper and your printer uh, from the manufacturer of the paper. But that's always going to be a generic profile. Every printer is different, like every camera is slightly different. And so you, you can never be sure that you're, that you're getting the, the, the colors that, you, that your printer is capable of unless you create your own profiles using that printer and your uh, you know your paper that of choice when you're looking at the output from the printer are you using like a specially daylight balanced light or are you just going to the window I'm going to the window <laughs> and and this is so I'm I'm a control freak but I'm also a realist and I so what I like to do is to to give my images the best chance under the under the you know the under the wing or whatever uh, uh, that I've created for it, I I don't go to extremes in that you know most of the time I can't control how my prints are going to be you know what the conditions or the environment that my prints are going to be hung under. Um, I I 
receive print orders from all around the world and I can't really go to each one of those and say okay I'm just going to take a a quick ambient light reading and I'll, I'll create your print for you so with that assumption I think that it's it's overkill to really go too crazy but you do want to look at if you if you're working in a relatively dark environment then your prints will look dark because they're reflecting the light rather than being backlit so you you should try to look in in bright conditions um, a, a window on on a normal sort of even on an overcast day will give you a good idea um, but yeah, I, I don't go too over the top on that. Um, and and uh, you know the last point here: don't leave the color management to the print drivers. I guess they're just they're not really created for the pros in mind, uh, where color fidelity is kind of the the, the main goal. Right. I, for the last so many years, I, I've only used Canon printers, and I know that they're all getting better. But I'll give give them their their due. A lot of the time, they they're getting much better now. the The printer will have a good, a pretty good sh shot at the at the final results if you did leave it to the printer's color management. But generally, even if you're you're grabbing the ICC profiles from the manufacturer of your paper, or, or using the one if you're using the the manu the printer manufacturer's paper, they're probably already installed for you. But you you'll get much better results uh, printing from Lightroom or Photoshop or Aperture if you say okay we do we don't want you to um, the the um, printer the, the manufacturers printer drivers to handle the color management I'm gonna tell you which profile to use and that will generally give you better uh, better end results we talked about uh, when, when we were doing a, a preview call a week ago we talked about the challenge of uh, not controlling the print process for all of your your images so for example you are a high-end fine art guy you print everything yourself if I'm just yeah. a you know the average wedding photographer who's trying to get stuff up as quickly as possible it's kind of challenging knowing that my four by four by sixes are going to be printed off of a Noritsu with a sRGB space and a certain ICC profile versus uh, you know a larger format 20 by 30 that might come off of an Epson what what's yeah, yeah. What, how does the how do you reconcile that sort of tension in the color management workflow? Well, I think that it's um, it's still in, it's important to make sure that you control what you can control. And if if you've used the tools that we've discussed and you're you're working on your images to the very last point that you have control of them on an environment that's been fully calibrated, then you're still going to end up with with better images, uh, higher quality higher quality prints if you hand off something that you know is is calibrated and, and to where you want it to be but again it's one of those things if if you're going to start to use a service that is perhaps going to use different profiles for each size that they that they will uh, output and you don't have any control over what the customer is going to select then you you really just need to get them to be, get them as accurate as you can be if if possible you might want to try to grab the ICC profiles from those the printer third-party printers, and if you do that, then you can often just take a look at your images. Even Lightroom 4 now has soft proofing built mm -hmm. in, so you know in the develop module, just hit the S key and you go into the soft proofing mode. Select that ICC profile and take a look at the images, and just make sure that they're relatively where you want them to be, and then just run some prep for some test prints. It's you know generally with these third-party um, printers. You can you can get test proofs at cost. You know you you just take off the profit part that you would normally add on for a customer sale, and just order a few of them and make sure that they're roughly where they where you think they should be. And it, once you've got an idea of that, then you, you're in good shape. You know I will say to that point and to the point that you made earlier, a lot of the complaints we've gotten from, from photographers in the past about prints not meeting their specification when they've gone through third-party printers have just not been exposed properly when we actually look at right. the digital file, right? Right, so, right. And, that, and that's the biggest thing. Yeah. If, and, and if people are darkening their monitors down and taking more care while they're actually shooting and exposing the images, a lot of that just goes away. So that said, you, you always print your own stuff. I do, yeah. Um, I've, I've had things printed externally when it's been just like too big. I, I, I had a, a customer sale a few months ago where they printed it at five five meters wide for for a wall mural, 
uh, and obviously I can't do that at home. Um, but if it's within the sizes that I can print here, uh, I, you know, for a, for a normal two by three aspect, I print up to twenty four by thirty six inches, and so for anything up to that size, I'll I'll do it myself. And for me, it's partly because I enjoy the process. I, I mean, I, I want to produce what what you can call original prints, which originally was like if it was Ansel Adams, it would have been him printing as opposed to an estate print where his family prints after he passed away. Yeah. But you know, even in the digital age. The photographer, the artist taking the process to the very end can still be called an original print, and that's what I want to sell for now. Um, but that's you know, I've I've learned to never say never. <laughs> it's, you know, you, I might make I might make third party prints available at some point as well. What, what's sort of your go to paper that you're using, and 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 what device are you using to create that ICC profile for that paper? Um, the my go to paper is. Uh, for a matte, I love matte papers. Um, the Breathing Color Optical One is amazing. Uh, the, the folks over at Breathing Color have, have produced a beautiful line of papers. Um, if I'm going to use a gloss, then their Vibrance Rag um, is a beautiful uh, Barita coated gloss paper. Uh, it's not overly glossy, it's almost like a satin, but they're, they're my two favorite papers. I also love their live canvas for, for gallery wraps and can box things. That they've created, but um, until now, I have been calibrating with initially the Color Monkey Photo, uh, then the i1 Pro original. It was an i1 Extreme package, uh, but now I'm I'm starting to use the i1 Pro 2, the the updated version, and I'm loving it. It's it's just so much easier to handle than the original i1, and the i the original i1 was great, but uh, you know. X-Rite just went all out on quality and redesigned it all from the ground up, and it just feels great to work to use. It's got uh, dual luminant uh, as a new feature, so it basically you don't have to deal with all of the UV cut stuff and everything. You just do a dual pass when you're scanning the uh, print targets, and it all just works. And um, it, it so that basically it will automatically compensate for any optical brightness that you get in a lot of new papers. Um, but yeah, it's it's it really does. Uh, Work much better than the original, so that's I'm I'm happy to be using that now as well. Do you build a new profile every time you change an ink cartridge or every time you open a new box of paper? <laughs> nah, I <laughs> again, I mean, I I generally base if I'm going to reprofile, it's usually based on on the work that I'm doing rather than the the day to day stuff. That you know, I mean, if I change an ink cartridge, I'm not going to go off and reprofile all of the papers that I use. But if I'm about to print for uh, an exhibition or something that's very color critical, then I'll just run a, a profile, a, a calibration before I, I do that. So it's really again just on just on that basis. Um, so you mentioned two years ago you went full time into photography. Uh, obviously, selling prints is is a revenue stream for you. Um, yes. Tell us kind of the what what works and what doesn't. Well. Like I said earlier, they, you know, for me, it's you're going to have a different, a hundred different ways for a hundred different photographers. But um, for me, I found that starting the blog uh, and the podcast, the podcast came first. Um, I was really one of the pioneers shortly after Chris Marquardt, and uh, Derek Story as well was just a few weeks after I started to release mine. But um, yeah, we we started these podcasts, and they've been amazing in helping us to get the word out about. Not only our own work, but also you know the community that sprung up around the the podcast has, has really helped a lot of other photographers as well. But you know, sharing and and just getting your work out there is so important these days. It, the the environment's changing so much. We have Google Plus now. I'm 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 really loving Google Plus. Uh, it's, it feels as though they developed that place just for photographers. Um, but it, yeah, if you are Interested in in selling your work, in it, it's one of those points. I mean, talking amongst other photographers, they're not always going to be the people that are pressing the buy button. But the good thing about about selling your about you know social networking with other photographers is that it increases your uh, you know your trustworthiness or if that's a word uh, with with Google and the search engine, not the not Google Plus. The more people link back to you, and the more people talk about you, the higher you're going to get ranked on in the search engines, and that's going to that's going to help you with everything that you do. Um, if people are, the biggest thing is people being able to find you. 
And if people can't find you, you can be the best photographer in the world and you're not going to sell a thing. Yeah. So really share, get out there, social network, um, and really make sure that your sites are all um, you know, optimized as well. And you should start to feel some, um, you know, some, a little bit of traction start to build as the people that know about you increase. Let's let's since we're uh, winding up our hour, let's get the uh, the thirty second pitch on on the book and the the workshop that you're doing. Sure. Um, so the workshop that I'm doing, I'm planning a talk called Pixels to Pigment, and I have to thank Chris Wilson in Okinawa here in Japan for the name. Uh, but the, this is going to be a series of workshops where we're going to basically build on the book Making the Print, which has been incredibly successful and. Um, what we've talked about today, we, we take this and do a two-day seminar where we're going to work through the entire digital workflow from camera to, you know, basically talk, touching on all of these things that we've, or building on uh, all of these things that we've talked about today and more. And that's still in the planning phases. Every, every location except a couple are probably at the point where they're going to go ahead. Uh, but to, for me to be able to make this happen, I do need people to go and register at the moment, it's still no commitment, uh, but I need to see how many people are probably going to turn up at each location. So if you can go to pixels2pigment.com uh, pixels and register your interest for the cities that we're, that we're visiting, then that would be great. I, I, will, I would definitely say, obviously, it's really hard to scratch much more than the surface in a one-hour one webinar. If you're serious about color management, man, the seminar is a way to do it. It just makes it so much easier to, to comprehend. And then obviously, yeah, here's we're the, actually the book. Gonna be yeah, we we're going to be printing um, during the during the workshop as well, and that's something that we can't do online here. Right, like this. exactly. And um, so, yeah, the book was uh, that was really amazing for me. That the the uptake on this has been incredible, and a lot of people. Um, I know that um, a good friend of mine, Doug K, he's probably listening at the moment. Great photographer. Uh, he said to me that uh, this basically got him printing for the first time in years. And I've heard that feedback from a lot of people. It, it's in, until now a lot of the printing books, especially, have been way over technical. Um, and I don't think you need to go that deep to make great prints. And, and that's what making the prints all about. That's fantastic. Uh, X Rite again. Uh, Brenda has been more than generous with X Rite to offer you guys some rebates on some of the products. Brenda, do you want to talk about that real fast? Yeah, I do, uh, and I also want to get Martin to answer one question that's really coming up uh, hot and heavy in the questions pane. Uh, these rebates are going to be especially for you folks who have attended. The $50 rebate on Color Monkey Photo is available just on the internet, but the other two rebates are going to be uh, specifically for you folks who attend the webinars. They are time sensitive and they are only available to folks in the U.S. and Canada, so uh, check with your local distributors in other countries for uh, other rebates that may be available. So the question that I see coming up, Martin, is uh, you mentioned some papers and apparently uh, folks did not uh, get uh, clearly what papers you were recommending there. So uh, maybe we just want to hit that one more time. Sure. And um, thanks, so thanks again for doing this uh, and thanks, Alan, for uh, allowing us to co-sponsor. My pleasure. It's been my pleasure, Brenda, and, and thanks to Photo Shelter as well. And yeah, the the paper that I mentioned is from Breathing Color, uh, and they're at breathingcolor.com. Uh, they don't sell through B&H, and they, they generally sell direct and, f and through a few select uh, com resellers. But the papers themselves are called uh, Optica One and Vibrance Rag. And they, these are their high-end papers. Breathing Color, basically, if, you, if you're printing for testing and just things like that, which you won't need to do if you implement the, <laughs> the procedures that we're talking <laughs> about, um, then they do do cheaper alternatives um, through their whole line. Um, but I also probably should mention that if you do go over to Breathing Color uh, and it, you're a first-time customer, if you use our code MBP20, you'll get a $20 discount there too. Um, so... They, yeah, there's a tile on the right side of my blog, um, and everything that I'm, I'm into is, uh, is all linked from martinbaileyphotography.com. So if you go there and then look at the tile on my blog on the right side, that'll take you to Breathing Color as well, and there's a note of the code. Awesome. 
And lastly, I just want to let the audience know about a photo conference that Photo Shelter is producing this September. Um, you know, the typical photo conference is kind of the same set of people talking about the same old thing. Um, but we really kind of wanted to look across industries and, and, and see how photography has really changed and impacted society. So we have uh, speakers coming from Facebook, Google, Lytro, Tumblr, Christie's, the, uh, the woman who sold the most expensive photograph ever, 20 by 200 and a lot more. So hopefully you can join us for that. Uh, learn more at photoshelter.com slash luminance. But I want to thank uh, x Rights and Brenda and Martin for, for a wonderful hour of information. Uh, this is being recorded. We'll put it up on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com uh, in the next 24 hours. Check out Martin's website at martinbailey.com. Get his podcasts. Look at his blog. Learn. Buy the book. Do it all. Uh, he's he's a, a, a real smart guy when it comes to the color management. Thank you so much, Martin, for joining us from Tokyo. You're very, very welcome, Alan. Thanks for thanks for having me, and and again, thanks to X Right as well as Photo Shelter for making this happen. I really appreciate it. Good guys, thanks for joining us. Uh, make sure you check out our other webinars coming up at photoshelter.com/about/webinar, and we hope to see you again. And have a great night. Bye bye. <laughs>